Hey there, marketing researchers. In this video conversation, we're going to talk about measurement and its application to marketing research. We're going to learn a few things while when we end this conversation. First, we should be able to understand what the concept of measuring is and understand how it's different when it comes time to measure objective and subjective properties. In addition, we should be able to explain the unique challenges that come along with measuring subjective properties. We should also have a good grasp of the basic terminology that's used to describe the various components of survey instruments and marketing measures. You should also be able to identify some common constructs that are measured in marketing research, as well as the, as well as the response scales that we often use to measure these concepts. You should have a solid grasp of the four different levels of measurement. You should be able to articulate how those different levels of measurement correspond with what we can do with the data in terms of analysis and data visualization. You should be familiar with the terms of reliability and validity and why those terms matter when it thinks about in, in terms of measuring things in marketing. Finally, you should understand the basic process of scale development and perhaps most importantly, know the value of utilizing pre-validated scales when conducting your own research. As we get started, let's introduce some basic terminology that we need to understand if we're going to be able to learn more about marketing measurement. As a warning, there's going to be a, a slide heavy with lots of terms and lengthy explanations, but we have to get through this in order to understand the more advanced concepts that will be explained later. All of these concepts will be explained shortly with illustrative examples. First, when we talk about measuring things, we're referring to we're usually referring to measuring properties. Properties are specific features or characteristics of an object that can be used to distinguish it from another object. Properties come in two flavors, objective properties and subjective properties. Let's start with the idea of a chair as an object. What are some of the properties that a chair may have? Well, in terms of objective properties, a chair may have a weight, may have a height, it may have a color with which it was manufactured, but there might be some subjective properties that also apply to chairs. If you're a marketer in the business of selling a chair, two relevant subjective properties may, may be one, the perception of its attractiveness or beauty. Secondly, a perception of how comfortable the chair is. These two mental constructs likely drive and influence whether or not a chair will be purchased by a given consumer. How are these different than the objective properties? Well, subjective properties are mental constructs, meaning they live up in the mind. These are not things that we can directly see. These are abstract concepts that we do believe really exist in the world, yet we can't directly measure them. We can only indirectly measure them. For example, brand loyalty or satisfaction. These are concepts that we readily believe exist as marketers, and we've even defined them in many different ways. Yet we've never directly observed them. When we use the phrase measurement, what we mean to be doing is determining how much of a property is possessed by a particular object. Measurement level means something different. Different measurements generate different qualities of data. The measurement level is an important term because it helps us characterize what level of data quality we'll be dealing with. Later in this conversation, we'll learn about the four different measurement levels. An instrument is a device that's used to take measurements. In marketing research, most instruments are usually designed to measure multiple different properties. For example, thinking back to that chair again, if we had someone take a questionnaire where one of the questions dealt with how beautiful they thought the chair was, another question dealt with how sexy they thought the chair was, another question dealt with what they thought a fair price for the chair would be, all three of those questions would comprise the survey instrument. A questionnaire item is a single question asked on a survey. In many cases, a single questionnaire item is plenty enough to measure a property that we're interested in. For example, if we were interested in measuring a consumer's age, we could just ask them, please enter your age. In other cases, it takes multiple questionnaire items to measure a single property. When this happens, we are referring to a scale. When multiple different items are used together to measure some sing single concept or construct or subjective property. Fortunately, we tend to be a little sloppy in the literature because we do use the phrase single item scale and multiple item scale. When we use the phrase single item scale, we mean that we are using just a single questionnaire item to measure some subjective property. The phrase multiple item scale means we're using multiple questionnaire items to measure a subjective property. If it's just the phrase scale, you can assume it is a multiple item scale. Response format is a general term used to describe the way that we allow a respondent to respond to a particular questionnaire item. For example, let's imagine we are asking someone what their household income was, and then we gave them a drop-down list, and in that drop-down list, they were asked to report their household income to the nearest $10,000.
This particular way of asking someone their household income is the response format. Response scale is much like the response format term, but it's a little more narrow. When we say response scale, what it means is it's the particular way in which we are measuring a subjective property. Coding and scoring are terms used to describe the particular way that we are actually numerically storing the data that we collect into our data set. For example, if we had three different questions all related to customer satisfaction in our survey instrument, and we wanted to find someone's overall satisfaction, one of our scoring rules may be take the average score of the three questions. Scaling is another term related to coding and scoring, but we use it specifically when we're assigning numerical values to subjective properties. Let's learn a little bit more about the idea of objective and subjective properties by taking a look at these two gentlemen here. These two guys are fans of Club Tijuana, the professional soccer team in TJ. Now there's a few objects that we can see in this image. For example, there's clearly face paint. Some of the objective properties of face paint include its color, viscosity, and price per ounce. All of these things can be measured and clearly they're objective in nature. In addition, we have objects that are human. Objective properties that this human may have would be income, age, their biological sex, and the number of Cholos games that they've attended last year. In addition, these humans may have some subjective properties, such as their satisfaction with the Cholos and their attitude toward Mexican League soccer. It's these subjective properties that marketing researchers are often interested in measuring, but it's much trickier to figure out exactly the right way to do so. If we understand that subjective properties are not directly observable, one of the things that quickly emerges is that we're going to have to find some sort of indirect way to measure these concepts. Therefore, we must take these mental constructs and translate them to some form of intensity continuum. There's an important requirement here. Whenever we have a construct, it must be clearly defined. For example, we've just been using the word satisfaction right now as though we have a clear understanding of what satisfaction means. If we're going to make a measurement system to measure satisfaction, we must be, we must be much clearer in what we mean by what satisfaction. Uh, and what we mean satisfaction is. Once we've clearly defined this construct, then we can develop some sort of concrete tool to measure the construct. This process of translating a clearly defined construct into a concrete measurement tool is called operationalization. That's a big word you can use to impress people at the next dinner party. We know that we can't drill a hole directly into this person's head and extract out their level of satisfaction with the Sholos. So how can we get at estimating what their level of satisfaction might really be? Well, first, following the steps above, we have to define it. Satisfaction with the Sholos is defined as the extent to which a consumer's expectations about the Sholos on-field and off-field experience has been met. This is the definition that we will work from to then develop our measurement system. Now we can operationalize it. And in this particular example, we've operationalized it with using, using two questionnaire items. On a five-point satisfaction scale, how satisfied are you with the on-field performance of Club TJ? On a five-point expectations met response scale, Overall, how well have the Sholos met your expectations for the home game experience? Then our scoring procedure says take the average score from the two questions. Now, we did in fact operationalize this construct into something that's concretely measurable. That doesn't necessarily mean that we've done it correctly. That's not what this slide is about. For example, look at our definition of what satisfaction means. If we haven't defined satisfaction correctly, and maybe this definition is inappropriate, then that means anything that we do subsequently is going to be incorrect. Secondly, look at these two survey questions that we've generated. One of them deals with a direct measure of satisfaction of on-field performance, and one deals with expectations being met for the home game experience. There might be other things that feed into people's satisfaction with Club TJ that's not about the home game experience nor about on-field performance, such as television, radio, uh, merchandise, the behavior of the team off the field, and so on. We're ignoring those entirely with our operationalized measures. In addition, look at our scoring procedure. It says take the average score from the two questions. Taking the average score from the two questions it makes life easy, but it does also create another assumption. We're assuming that satisfaction with the Sholos is equally driven by on-field performance and meeting expectations at the home game. Perhaps this isn't true. Perhaps on-field performance is the key driver and it deserves additional weight. Even in this brief example here, it becomes immediately apparent this idea of measuring subjective properties can be rather tricky. Oftentimes when we measure subjective properties, we use multi-item scales. Let's, I would like to provide you a couple examples of multi-item scales that are used in marketing research. In particular, we're going to look at compulsive buying. There's a paper from 1992 by Faber and O'Quinn where they define compulsive buying as chronic, repetitive purchasing that becomes a primary response to negative events or feelings. So negative stressful events trigger some sort of uncontrollable purchasing 
and this is what they define as compulsive buying. This is the scale that they've developed. Let's look at some of these, let's take a look at some of the early terminology we had and how it applies to this scale that's in front of us. First, when they conducted this study, there were other questionnaire items about gender, income, self-esteem, and, other, and others. Therefore, the entirety of this thing, including the scale you see before you, is called the instrument. The compulsive buying scale itself is a multi-item scale. I see seven different items here, one at the top and six below. Each of these individual seven questions represent the questionnaire items. There's two different types of response scales that are used in this particular scale. We have an agreement scale above. There's just one question that corresponds with that response scale whereas a subjective frequency scale is used for the remaining six items below. The scaling system was rather straightforward for this particular scale. In all cases, a one to five scoring methodology was used. Then, Faber and Gwynn provides us the way to properly calculate someone's individual compulsive buying score. If you look below, the very bottom there, you'll see that compulsive buying is equal to, and then there's a math equation. If you see those bold terms, Q1A, Q2A, Q2B, and so on, the idea is that we would take those numerical values that are in the green section above, and we would plug those corresponding values down into that math equation, and then we simply just solve. And then according to the paper by Faber and O'Gwin, if somebody scores lower than negative 1.34 after we complete that math equation, that person's labeled as a compulsive buyer. Let's take a look at another alternative compulsive buying scale. This idea of competing scales is pretty common in marketing research. Subjective properties are tricky to measure. Therefore, there's lots of different people who've tried to tackle measuring important subjective properties. First, look at Ridgway's definition of compulsive buying. It's a little different than the one that, was look, that we saw earlier. Compulsive buying is defined as a consumer's tendency to be preoccupied with buying that is revealed through repetitive buying and a lack of impulse control over buying. Notice that there's nothing about stressful events triggering compulsive buying in this particular definition. Look at some of these questions, uh, these questions that were asked of the survey respondents below and notice how these questions correspond more closely to Ridgway's definition here rather than facing Faber and O'Gwin's definition of compulsive buying earlier. This should underscore just how important it is to properly define the way that you're characterizing your subjective property. Here we see the response scales that are associated with Ridgway's new measures in this six item, multi item scale. First, there are four seven point agreement scales, and below, there are two seven point subjective frequency scales, with only the edge anchors of always and never being actually labeled. Ridgway's scaling was similar to the approach used by Faber and O'Gwin, except of course since they have seven different points, they have a seven point scoring system. This time though, higher scores tend to correspond with more compulsive buying indication. So for example, look at that first question, my closet has unopened shopping bags in it. If you're someone who has that, maybe you're more likely to be a compulsive buyer and you just say that you strongly agree with a score of seven. Ridgway's scoring process was much easier than the one Faber and O'Gwin proposed. Ridgway says simply to sum up the scores that a person had to all six questions. In other words, all six questions were treated equally important. So if someone disagreed, strongly disagreed to all six questions, they would score a six, meaning the lowest possible score in the compulsive buying scale, where if we summed up uh, someone who agreed strongly to all these questions, they get a max score of 42, which is the highest compulsive buying score they could have. A fair question to ask is why we use multiple items to measure a subjective property. The answer is that it's often unlikely that a single question is capable of perfect, perfectly capturing the concept we're interested in, interested in measuring. For example, let's consider again the concept of compulsive buying. And now let's consider one of those measurement items. This is one of the ones that's used by Ridgway. Much of my life centers around buying things. This single item clearly, clearly has some overlap with the idea of compulsive buying, but it also misses the mark. As just a few examples, perhaps somebody who has a job as a buyer for an industrial firm says that much of their life centers around buying things. It has nothing to do with them being a compulsive buyer, merely that their career actually is, does in fact center around buying things. Or maybe someone's a passionate collector of Star Wars memorabilia. This is a hobby that they're very interested in and therefore their life centers around buying things. This is something that they score high on, but they're not actually compulsively doing it. It's a, natu it's a healthy hobby. Or perhaps a stay-at-home parent who's annoyed with all the required shopping that they have to do. Perhaps that they say that much of their life centers around buying things, but this is more a, a articulation of their frustration rather than an indication of their actual compulsive buying behavior. This simple illustration shows why we often use multiple items. In most cases, we know that any given questionnaire item is not going to completely cover the concept and it'll miss the mark in other ways. The idea is if we use multiple items, we will be able to capture all the different subtle domains of that concept and in aggregate, when we average those things together or weigh those things together in some other way, 
we will better capture the underlying subjective property. With that said, multi-item multi measures seem to be in less frequent use in contemporary marketing research. Recent trends in marketing research have tended to favor single item scales or very short multi-item scales, four items or less. Why is this? Well, we are aware that survey respondents are becoming increasingly intolerant of lengthy surveys. We simply cannot ask people to spend as much time on a marketing survey as we used to be able to. Therefore, we have to shorten the number of items or we won't have valid responses. In addition, we've also learned that survey respondents become frustrated or annoyed when they believe that they are answering identical questions. Oftentimes, when we have people fill out many different questionnaire items, all tapping into the same subjective property, those questions may seem somewhat similar to the person taking the survey. This tends to frustrate them, and a frustrated respondent does not give thoughtful answers. If a survey respondent sees multiple items that all look similar to one another, they may begin to start generating their own hypotheses about what the purpose of the study is. This is not healthy for your research. You don't want your respondents trying to guess what the actual study is about, and it because if they do, they may alter their responses to fit those expectations. So this current trend of reducing the number of multi-item measures in marketing research could be summarized as, it's better to have a survey respondent thoughtfully and honestly answer a single best-in-class question rather than be poorly engaged with answering multiple questions. Let's take a look at a popular single item scale. The Net Promoter Score scale is one of the most common scales that marketers use in the world today. You've probably seen this scale as well and have responded to this scale in a recent survey. The NPS scale question always comes in this format. How likely is it that you would recommend this company to a friend or colleague? Sometimes where it says company, it could actually be the name of the company, a brand, a product, a service, or an experience. A traditional net promoter score scale question should have 11 points, zero to 10, with the anchors being not at all likely to extremely likely. After respondents complete the net promoter score scale question, those codes are then recoded for the actual scoring purposes of the marketing researcher. If a respondent scores from zero to six on this scale, they're recoded as a detractor. You can imagine this as a negative one. If they respond with a seven or eight, they're coded as a neutral, that's a score of zero. And if they're scored a nine or 10, they're called a promoter, they score a positive one. Then it comes time to score a company's net promoter score. So it's a rather easy computation. You take all the survey responses and a company's net promoter score is simply the percentage of promoters, so those people who answered nine or 10, minus the percentage of detractors, those who scored zero to six. That means the potential minimum would be negative 100, every single person was a detractor, or a potential maximum of 100 where every single person was a promoter. The net promoter score is a pervasive concept in today's marketing world. In this chart here, the Temkin Group reports some of the results that they have for various companies that they've calculated net promoter scores for. Here you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different industries and the range and average net promoter scores of those companies within those industries. A few things pops out. First, take a look at auto dealers. On average, the average auto dealer has the highest net promoter score amongst all the industries that are being shown here fast food chains have the lowest average net promoter score. In addition, parcel delivery services have the smallest range, ranging from 15 to 32, whereas fast food chains also have the widest range of net promoter scores, ranging all the way down to negative 11. Let's explore and learn about the four different levels of measurement. Whenever a scale is used to take a measurement, the data that comes as a result of that measurement will come in one of four different levels, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. You will never forget these four different measurement levels because you'll always remember the French word for black, noir, N-O-I-R. That order is also important. Nominal level data is the lowest quality level of data. Ratio is the highest level of data. Anything that nominal data can do, ordinal data can also do, plus additional benefits. Anything that ordinal data can do, interval can do, plus additional benefits. Anything that interval can do, ratio can do, with additional benefits. Let's start with the first level of data, nominal. All data that is collected is at least nominal level data. Nominal level data is merely used to categorize things. This is best illustrated by a couple examples. So in the context of bas uh, baseball, if I asked you what state does your favorite baseball team play in and you said Michigan, I may use the number 12 to categorize the state of Michigan but I can't add that number 12 to the number 16 of California, gaining sort of insight. Merely those numerical codes are merely used to put answers in different buckets. In the world of pop or comic culture, if I asked you, did you read a comic book in the last 30 days? The answers might be yes, no, I don't remember. 
And again, I might use a code of one for yes, two for no, but those numbers are just arbitrary. They're used just to categorize an individual's response. The next level of data is ordinal. Ordinal data is superior to nominal data because it has order. Those numbers that are larger are in, are in fact greater than those numbers that are lesser. However, we don't know precisely how much greater those values are. We just know that they are larger. For example, if I asked you at the end of the season, what place did your favorite baseball team finish in its division, and you said fourth place, you would know that they did better than the fifth place team, and they did worse than the third place team, but you wouldn't know by how much. You wouldn't know if the fourth place team was very close to actually winning the first place spot, or if they were much closer to actually taking last place. If I asked you to rank from best to worst the Star Wars movies, and you said that The Phantom Menace was your favorite movie, one, you'd be a crazy person, and two, although it's your favorite, I have no sense of how much you like that movie compared to all the other ones. Perhaps you just barely like Phantom Menace more and you really have a distaste for all the others. Or maybe Phantom Menace really is your love because you care about Jar Jar Binks so much and all the other movies are a distant second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Interval level data is different than ordinal because it still has order to it, but now those orders are equally spaced. So now we can do things like calculate averages and, and add them together. For example, if I asked you to how much you agree with the following with a requisite five point scale, I am a baseball fan, we, we would say that a score of five on that baseball fan scoring scale is one point greater than those who scored four and two points greater than those who scored three. If I said on a seven point like dislike scale, how would you evaluate Iron Man 2? I, if you answered six, I could say that you scored exactly two points better than you did for four which is twice as much as if you had scored a five. Finally, the highest level of data is ratio. It's exactly the same as interval. In other words, each numerical distance is equal, but there's one additional property. Now, the value of zero actually has an objective meaning. What do I mean by this? Well, consider this example. In the last month, how many times did you watch a baseball game on TV? If you say one, you literally mean one. If you said zero, you mean zero. I can't just arbitrarily recode that value as 10 and still pretend that it means nothing. A value of zero has a true objective meaning. If I asked you how much money you spent at Comic-Con last year and the answer was zero dollars, I couldn't recode it and say that you spent hundred dollars because zero actually literally means zero dollars. What's interesting here is that ratio data can only really be captured for objective properties. For subjective properties, interval level data is the highest level of data that we can collect. That's because subjective properties are mental constructs. They're abstract. Therefore, the place where zero is is arbitrary. It's, just, it's somewhere in the aether that we can't readily find. Therefore, ratio level data is impossible to obtain. One of the ways to understand the relative advantages of the four different levels of data is by understanding some of the summary statistics that we can calculate based on the level of data we have on hand. For example, for all four levels of data, we can always calculate the mode. But if we want to calculate the median, the place where the data set is split in two different halves, we must have at least some order in our data set. Therefore, we must have at least ordinal level data. If we actually want to calculate the average, or the mean, we must have equal distance between each one of the values. Interval and ratio data can easily calculate the mean. Ordinal data, on the other hand, because we don't know how far apart those different values are from one another in ranking, we actually cannot correctly calculate the mean. Finally, only ratio and interval data can have a proper variance or standard deviation calculated. Why is this? Well, to calculate a variance, you need to know what the mean is because the definition of variance is how much your data tends to disperse away from the mean. To, so therefore, to calculate a variance and in turn a standard deviation, you must be able to calculate a mean. Let's give a few examples of how some concepts can be operationalized multiple different ways at multiple different levels of data. Let's take this idea of brand loyalty. In 1999, Oliver defined brand loyalty as a deeply held commitment to rebuy or repatronize a preferred product service consistently in the future, thereby causing repetitive same brand or same brand set purchasing, despite situational influences and marketing efforts having the potential to cause switching behavior. Whew, that's a lengthy definition and not the only definition of brand loyalty that's out there. Let's see if we can attempt to operationalize this definition into some different measurements at four different measurement levels, all representing brand loyalty. It's noteworthy that none of these individual measures are perfect, to, uh, contingent on the previous definition. But I'd like to illustrate the idea that we can often measure uh, subjective properties at different measurement levels. First, would you consider yourself committed to Adidas? One of the definitions, one of the parts of the definition of brand loyalty was commitment to the brand. So we could merely ask them, are they committed? Yes, no, and a. Again, these are just categorical answers. Therefore, this would be nominal level data. If we wanted to add some order to it, perhaps we presented the brand Adidas in context of some competitors. 
If you remember what British Knights are, congratulations, you're a little older than my typical student. Consider the following brands. Please rank in order the brands, with first place being the one you are most loyal to, loyal to, and fourth place being the brand you are least loyal to. Now, if someone said second for Adidas, we would know that it's their second most favorite brand, but we wouldn't know if it's razor sharp close to their first most favorite brand, or if their first most preferred brand, say Nike, is a far distant first and Adidas is close to New Balance and British Knights. Here's an example of brand loyalty being measured in an interval way. How much do you agree with the following statement? I would be willing to pay a higher price for Adidas over other brands. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. Marketers would typically take this type of scale and calculate means, variance, and standard deviations. Therefore, we tend to treat this as interval. We will see in a second why I say tend to treat this as interval. Finally, think about the shoe purchase you have made in the past year. By your best estimate, how many pairs of shoes did you buy that were Adidas? By your best estimate, how many pairs of shoes did you buy that were not Adidas? Since part of the definition of brand loyalty, at least defined by Oliver, includes this idea of repurchase, we could make an inference that people's objective behavior regarding Adidas shoe purchase relative to other shoe purchase is an indicator of brand loyalty. On the other hand, we learned earlier that ratio level data is only possible for objective properties. And clearly here, me measuring how many shoes people actually bought, bought is a indicator that is objective. Zero means you really did buy zero shoes. However, the concept brand loyalty has a subjective property component to it. Therefore, this final measure here, that's ratio, is truly a bit of a construal of the underlying idea of brand loyalty. I just provided it here as illustration of the four different measurement levels. Earlier I said that the interval scale that we used for the brand loyalty measure of Adidas is treated as interval. What did I mean by that? Well, consider the following example. When I go to the movies, I tend to prefer superhero movies over other genres. And here we see a standard Likert scale five point. Now, if it's an interval level scale, we treat each one of these points as equally distant from one another. And clearly here, when we see this on this, on this slide, they are equally distant from one another. But these equal distances in the, on paper are not necessarily how they map onto someone's mind. Here we have the, coding, the scoring codes that we may use. Notice I used a zero for neither agree nor disagree, but that's an arbitrary point. I could use any other value. I could slide it from one, two, three, four, and five from strongly disagree to strongly agree being five because the zero is an arbitrary place. Let's imagine a person who is extremely agreeable. When they face this question, when they go to the movies, I tend to prefer superhero movies over other genres, perhaps they have a bit of an acquiescence bias. They have a tendency to want to strongly agree with people. Or they're just the kind of person who falls in line. In that person's mind, there's not equal spacing between these concepts. Instead, this person is very likely and very easy to strongly agree with this type of statement. Notice how the strongly agree button uh, option here is shrank towards the neutral point, whereas strongly disagree and disagree have moved further out to the left. Now imagine an alternative kind of person, a person who's very hard to be willing to agree nor disagree. They're very wishy-washy, so they tend to always be neutral on things. When this person sees this question, they may be heavily inclined to always neither agree nor disagree, and they, for them to agree, they must stretch and they must be very intensely uh, in agreement with this particular statement. In other words, for each one of these individuals, it's the mental distance between each one of these labels that generates uh, that generates how they feel about these particular concepts. But if these scales really are interval, they must be equally spaced. But it's readily clear here that these aren't necessarily equally spaced for each person. Instead, they're only ordinally spaced. We do know that strongly agreeing is certainly greater than agreeing for every person, but we don't know by how much. That's why earlier I said for these types of subjective scales, we as marketing researchers assume that we're dealing with interval data but we're actually only certain that we're dealing with ordinal level data. Why do we do this? Well, interval data is extremely easy to work with. Once you can calculate an average, and once you can calculate a variance in standard deviation, there's a number of statistical tools that we can use that we don't have available to us when we're dealing with ordinal level data. This is a convenience for us that makes life a bit easier. In addition, there's some research out there that suggests that when we take these subjective continuum scales and treat them as interval, even though they may only be ordinal, we're not as punished as heavily as it may seem when we're conducting our analysis. Instead, it usually just means that we need to collect a slightly larger sample size than normal sample size calculations would imply. Okay, now that we've introduced the four different levels of measurement, why should we even care about this? This feels awfully like the kind of academic thing that shows up on a test, but not necessarily the kind of thing that actually matters in the real world for a marketer. Fortunately, that's not true at all. In fact, measurement level is enormously important. When, if you have the ability to look at a particular piece of data and identify what measurement level it's at, 
you have a upper hand compared to other individuals dealing with data. First, by knowing the level of data you're dealing with, it tends to reveal the types of statistical procedures that are proper for analysis. In addition, by understanding the level of data you're dealing with, it helps you understand the ways that you can visualize and present that data to others so that they can easily understand it. In addition, by understanding the level of data that you're dealing with, it in indirectly or partially gives you information about the difficulty a respondent taking your survey will have in answering a particular question, and it'll also give you some insights into the questionnaire wording approach when you're actually writing the individual questionnaire items that is best suited for designing that question. Take a look at this chart here. This is a standard pie chart. This is a pie chart that's appropriate to use because we know we're dealing with nominal level data. Order doesn't actually matter, just the amount of individuals responded a particular way. For consumer loyalty rankings, we know we can't report the average ranking, but we can report the percentiles of individuals who responded in a particular way to each question. For the interval question, we can also report those scales, but we can report the mode, median, and, as we see in the bottom right-hand corner there, the average value. Similarly, for ratio level data, we can report the mode, median, averages, and we can report all those respondents that we had that were 0%. An important thing to keep in mind when thinking about measurement level is if you collect data that's rich in quality, like ratio or interval, you can always rescale it down if it suits your purposes later. But if you collect low level data, such as nominal or ordinal data, you can't scale it back up after the fact. Let's take a look at this net promoter scale question again. We already learned how we handle the coding here. After people respond from zero to 10, we then recode people into detractors, passive, or promoters. Or put another way, we collect interval level data, people scoring 0 to 10. So we have five people here, 0, 6, 10, 8, and 9 were their responses. But for purposes of the net promoter score scale, we don't actually use this interval level data. Instead, we record it, I'm sorry, we recode it into nominal level data, detractors, promoters, and passives, just buckets of individuals. And then we use our calculations. Conversely, we, we couldn't go the other way. If we started by categorizing somebody as a detractor, after the fact, if someone asked, well, which detractors are the biggest detractors and which, which detractors are only mild detractors, we couldn't answer that question. Something that emerges once we realize some of these facts about measurement level is why shouldn't we just always capture high quality data, interval or ratio level data? The answer is, well, we should. If we can collect interval or ratio level data with no downside, we should in fact do so. However, there's often a data richness versus survey respondent frustration trade-off. Consider these three different questions. Exactly how much money did you spend last month on apps, either purchases within an app or for the app itself? Next question. How much money did you spend on apps in the last month? And then we offer the option $0, $1 to $5, or more than $5. Finally, did you spend any money on apps in the last month, either on purchases within an app or for the app itself? And we just give them the option yes or no. If you were given these survey questions, which one would be the hardest one for you to respond to? Most people would probably pick the first option. It'd be hard to recall exactly how much money you spent. This would mean that people have to spend a lot of their co cognitive load on trying to properly answer this particular question on the survey, tiring them out and getting them frustrated. However, if they answer this question, we would actually have ratio level data. We would know the exact dollar amount. Probably the easiest of these three questions to answer is the one at the bottom. Did you spend any money at all? They merely have to recall if some sort of expenditure occurred. This would be nominal level data though. We'd be stuck with a lower level quality of data and we wouldn't have the deep insight into which types of people spent particularly large amounts of money. This is what we mean by the idea of sometimes when we collect data in marketing research, there's a trade-off between catch collecting high, high measurement level data versus not frustrating our respondents. Next, let's introduce the concepts of reliability and validity and how they apply to data collection and marketing research. Reliability is when a respondent responds in the same or similar manner to an identical or nearly identical measure. In other words, it's consistent. Validity, on the other hand, is the accu accuracy of a response to a measure. For another way, when we say we're measuring something, we really are indeed measuring that thing. Oftentimes, when it comes time to illustrate reliability and validity, it's done by way of a target. Look at these three targets below. Let's imagine that our objective is to hit the bullseye. Which one of these represents a valid, but not reliable, shooting gun? That would be the one in the middle. Notice how the shots are all scattered, often missing the mark, so they're not, it's not reliable, but if we imagine that we averaged all of these uh, bullets in, into, the, into one spot, 
it would be in the center. So even though it's inconsistent, we are attempting to do that thing of hitting the bullseye. Next question, which one of these targets is reliable but not valid? That's the, that's the bullseye in the far left. It's very consistent. Look how close all those bullet holes are gathered together. Unfortunately, they're not hitting the target. Finally, let's take a look at the last target on the far right hand side. That appears to be both reliable and valid. It's hitting the mark and that mark is what we intend to hit. Now, if this, this target was customer satisfaction, an example of a question that might result in reliability but not validity is how likely are you to shop at Walmart in the future? Likelihood of future behavior is intentions. That's not customer satisfaction. It's a thing that we think happens partly because of customer satisfaction. So that might be an example where we can get a reliable signal, but we're not actually getting a valid signal. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, are you happy with Walmart? It's really hard to come up with examples of questions that are going to be valid but not reliable at all. Reliability and validity often go hand in hand. But in this particular case, we're imagining a scenario where because of this idea of uh, only the highest score of 10 is being labeled and the lowest score is not, and the word happy is being used instead of satisfaction, we imagine that maybe this is a valid measure. It does tap into this idea of customer satisfaction, but it might not actually be all that consistent. Finally, a measurement that might be valid and reliable would be something like this. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not at all satisfied, 5 being neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, dissatisfied, and 10 being very much satisfied, how satisfied are you with your shopping at Walmart? We are precisely asking them how satisfied they are. So we would imagine this measure is aligned up with the idea of customer satisfaction. We've clearly labeled the far anchor points, 1 and 10, as well as the neutral standpoint in 5. So therefore, we would suspect that this is a valid and reliable. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce to you some of the more common response scales that are used in marketing. This is by no means an exhaustive list. We've already introduced the Likert scale numerous times. I think it's important to note that some people are a little haphazard with their use of the phrase Likert scale. Some people think that any multi-point scale with two different uh, words across the end on the end with some continuum constitute a Likert scale. That's simply incorrect. It must be some form of agreement scale. Whether it is a seven point agreement scale or an agree agreement scale that doesn't use exactly the precise language you see here. That's a Likert scale. A semantic differential scale is also popular in marketing research. The idea of a semantic differential scale is to pick two adjectives are to the opposite of one another and place them at the far ends of a scale. You don't have to use the exact same words that we had here for the example of red lobster. Once people are presented these two opposite words, we ask people how well these two words uh, correspond to their opinion of that target. So in this case, I would associate red lobster with moderate prices. There it's an inconvenient location, not really for me in a neutral, cold or warm atmosphere. A percentage scale is extremely common particularly heavily used for purchase intentions or forward-looking behavior where we ask people to estimate how likely they are to do something. Important scales are also very common in marketing research. We're very interested in knowing which attributes and features matter to people. Subjective knowledge scales are very common in marketing research. Familiarity scales are very common in marketing research. Asking people to evaluate the goodness or badness of things is also very common in marketing research, particularly when we're evaluating their attitudes. And of course, a variety of different satisfaction response scales. Another type of scale that you may have done in the past is the comparative rating scale. A comparative rating scale is where we present people a list of features, we allocate them a number of points. In this example here, we give them 100. And we tell them to allocate those points across those different features, which their points indicate how important each one of those things are. I highly recommend that you do not use comparative rating scales. Despite their popularity, they tend to frustrate respondents. Right now, look at this task in front of you. Halfway through, completing a survey, you might, presented a, you might be presented a survey question like this. So in the middle of doing a survey, which you may already be frustrated with, you're now asked to do a math problem. Most people do not enjoy this process. Later this semester, we'll talk about research techniques that are far superior if we want to measure how important different features are to individuals. Finally, let's have a brief conversation about developing our own scales. First of all, developing a scale is something that should not be done arbitrarily. There should be a process that systematically guides you through it. There are multiple different proposed scale development procedures out there. I would argue that the best procedure of all is to take advantage of others' hard work. Academics, in particular, are well trained in the process of developing scales. It can take new, many different projects, many different hours, and a lot of fancy statistical analysis to render a scale that's appropriate for high-level research. I would encourage you to leverage these, thing, these scales that are, off, that are already created by many marketing academics and high-level marketing researchers. 
Go to Google Scholar and search through marketing and management journals looking for a scale that measures the, the concept you're interested in. In addition, marketing borrows heavily from psychology and sociology. Look at those journals for measures that may be of interest to you. In addition, people are in such heavy need of marketing scales that we also have a numerous handbooks out there that readily list hundreds upon hundreds of different scales that you could use for your own research purposes. Here are just a few of the scale handbooks that you might find useful to yourself. I own a few of these and the library at SDSU also has several of these books on reserve. Here's an example of using Google Scholar. I searched the phrase brand loyalty scale and right away the first two things I found were two useful scales that could help me, help me measure brand loyalty. However, if you find yourself in a situation where you do have to develop your own scale, there are a number of procedures out there that you can use to, to follow to become better at developing a useful scale. While there's a lot of different ways to develop a scale, Many of them are based off of Churchill's method that was published in 1979. Here's the eight step process that Churchill recommends when developing your own scale. I'm not gonna go into the details of how to do this other than just give you a high level overview. These first three steps, specifying the domain of the construct is where you're defining the construct very clearly. Then, based on the definition that you have developed, you generate a long list of potential questionnaire items. Sometimes you may generate 40 or 50 different questionnaire items that you're thinking about using for your ultimate scale ultimately realizing you'll only be using a handful of them. Then, based on expert opinion, qualitative research with consumers, focus groups, and literature reviews, you may start to reduce these items down to a more manageable set. Once you've reduced this, this set of questions down to a more manageable set, you'll collect some preliminary data. That's step four, where it says purify measure. At this stage, a variety of statistical tools, those that are beyond the scope of today's class, can be utilized to help you identify which measurement items contain promise and which of those are unlikely to be useful for your final scale. Exploratory factor analysis, or EFA, is likely the most common procedure used during this stage. Once you've reduced your number of scale items even further, you'll collect another larger set of data to work towards the final set of questionnaire items for your scale. At this stage, you'll engage in steps six and seven, which is assess the reliability of your instrument, and assess the validity of your instrument. And again, there's a variety of different statistical procedures that help you assess how reliable your tool is and how valid your tool is. Now it's likely at any one of these stages, you're going to run into some problems that indicates you've made missteps earlier in your process of developing your scale. That's what these red lines indicate here. Feedback loops, sending you back to earlier parts of the scale development process so that you can continue on with a hopefully a better understanding of how to develop a proper scale. If you get through this entire process, the very last step is what you conclude with, developing scoring rules and norms. 